We are very happy to have Yvesita Dato telling us about Lagrangian cobordisms, enriched knot diagrams, and algebraic structures. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And um, I'm happy fall quarter starting again. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about some things out of which uh, the algebraic structures part is very much work in progress and take it with like a large chunk of salt. Um, we're, we're working out like kinks and some of the kinks are big. Okay. Okay, so to get us started, I'm going to define. Okay. I'm going to define what a Lagrangian cobordism is because it means many things for many people. Um, and so for me, um, I'm working in R4. Um, oh yeah, please feel free to stop me whenever you have questions. Um, and I'm taking this uh, standard symplectic form, which I did not uh, in these coordinates. And a Lagrangian cobordism, um, L from a knot or a link K1 to K2 uh, is, a, um, is an embedded uh, compact, sorry, I can't write, okay. uh, oriented uh, Lagrangian, in, um, L, which is going to be contained in this sort of constrained space uh, by which I'm constraining the last coordinate. And I want the boundary to lie in um, two hyperplanes, copies of R3. Um, let me just write it. But R3B is when I restrict the Y2 coordinate to be B. So that's a slice of R3, like it's a hyperplane. Um, and so let's, so A is less than B. Let's call the lower boundary um, the negative boundary. And that has to be equal to K1. And this is the positive boundary, and it's equal to K2. Okay. Um, and uh, these are transverse intersections. And the other condition I need is I want L to be relatively exact, which is a new term. Uh, it's a slight generalization of exactness. Uh, what I mean by this is recall that the symplectic form defines a map from uh, the relative H2 to R by just evaluation. And I want the image of this map to be um, generated by this quantity A. And A is going to be the integral of lambda. So what is lambda? Lambda is the primitive um, for omega on the negative boundary, and I take absolute values. <clears throat> um, notice that this actually becomes the integral of just x1 dy1, because the boundary is lying in a constant y2. And because L is Lagrangian, uh, this is the same as the integral on the positive boundary. That's just Stokes' theorem. OK, so this is a generalization of exactness. So in exactness, these integrals would be 0. And then you would want um, the image to just be 0 always. OK, but this lets us extend to slightly more um, general Lagrangians. OK, and why am I considering this object? Um, slight motivation is if you have like a giant Lagrangian L inside R4, it could be very big. Generically, um, it will intersect these R3 A's and B's transversely. Um, and also, this, um, these intersections will be closed. So closed one-dimensional manifolds and knots or links. So if you just restrict this to this enclosed space, 
uh, where I'm restricting the fourth coordinate, y2. So it looks something, it's like the purple thing in this picture over here. Um, that becomes a Lagrangian cobordism that I defined. So this is sort of a chunk of like a big Lagrangian that you might care about. Okay. Okay. Um, and how are we going to study these? Obviously, it's too general to just be like, tell me what they are. Um, we're going to study these based on the boundary. Um, Sorry, can I, can I ask, how does relative exactness enter from this picture where you take something and you slice it? Um, it's, so it, it's, um, it's sort of saying that even if you have genus, it's not, um, like you don't have very awkward looking handles, which is small. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, but then um, we're gonna look at like the boundary knots and most of the data of these boundary knots is topological, but there's some geometric data. So which we're gonna capture in what I call an enriched diagram. So an enriched diagram um, starts with the usual knot diagram, which has an oops, uh, immersed curve, um, let's call it D inside R2, which is the Lagrangian projection of the knot, okay? So it's one of these immersed knots and um, these intersections should actually just be crossings. I haven't, I've drawn it with the, uh, without the intersection, just because it's easier for me. Um, and there are some signs uh, which I denote by sigma, um, which says, if you go anti-clockwise and jump down, you're looking from like top X2. Um, this is what the signs look like. Um, this is slightly different from a lot of standard Legendrian uh, 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 sign conventions. Um, I think what you should remember is this one, picture over here is the one that has a Legendrian representative. Um, Okay, and so this is sort of topological data. And then we have geometric data, which is um, some areas, it's known by A. So for any um, bounded domain in like the complement of this immersed curve, um, I'm gonna have a positive number um, like B, which is gonna denote the area. And if you have an actual knot, you're calculating the area with respect uh, to the standard uh, metric on R2. Okay, and uh, we're gonna define equivalence classes of these. So two of these, uh, D1, sigma one, A1, is equivalent to D2, sigma two, A2. Uh, if there's a diffeomorphism from R2 to R2, taking one of these, to the other and preserving um, the signs and the areas in whatever way, uh, in the standard way you imagine. But the area it's in preserving, it, so this is not an area preserving map, it's only preserving areas of these chunks. Okay, okay. what I mean is that if I draw a thing like this, or if I sort of thin it out, but elongate it, these two can be equivalent if those areas are the same. Okay. Um, okay, so we're gonna use these diagrams to talk about the Lagrangian cobordisms. And how are we gonna do that? So um, turns out that the existence of these Lagrangians um, gives us a partial order. So we say that one diagram um, undercuts, uh, you can, uh, another diagram, uh, if there exists a Lagrangian cobordism, L from a link K1 to K2, such that the knot Ki has diagram 
Um, Uh, so note that this diagram coming from KI, um, it's a class and the KI for a particular diagram is not unique in the sense that the height function, the X2 can vary, but that information doesn't matter here. Okay, and so the question we can ask obviously is that given uh, two diagrams, Uh, can we obstruct the existence of this um, Lagrangian? Okay, um, so some initial progress, um, I mean, there's a lot of progress, but exactly in this framework um, was um, a paper I put on archive in 2021 uh, where we we define an obstruction, which is um, using some holomorphic curve techniques. Um, and I'll describe that now. Okay, so what are these obstructions? So to make some definitions. Um, so suppose you're given two diagrams. So then you're given um, let's say something like this. So the, the upper ones are D2s and lower ones are D1s. And we are asking whether these Lagrangians in between exist. Okay, so we have some examples. We first define a big disk. So a disk is something that's like um, seen, it's one of these bounded regions um, cut out by the immersed diagram curve, okay? And so a big disk is a disk, um, let's call it A, with um, boundary inside a diagram D2 uh, with all positive corners. So in this picture, it could be this one, this lobe here. It could also be the lobe right next to it. And over here, it can be A4. Um, what about the middle picture? So you can replace D2 with D1 and positive with all negative. So in the middle picture, it's one of these bottom lobes, okay? And once you've chosen a big disk, um, you can choose oops, a little disk sort of with respect to, um, let, no, let's call it relative. Relative A, so it's a disk B. This is slightly more complicated. Okay, so either del B is in D1, like the bottom one, uh, with all positive corners. So this is for, um, like the stuff not in the bracket, okay? Okay, or del B is in D2 with plus sign um, only at corners common with A. Okay, little weird looking definition. So, um, so in the first picture, we could have either of the bottom two to be little to the pink one, but also this one next to it. Um, and in this picture, so this plus sign only common is seen here. So it has a plus sign, which is common with the pink one, like that corner, um, but the other signs are negative. Turns out all of these can be little, like candidates for a little disk. Okay, um, and what do you do once you have this? So the theorem, is that if um, this partial order, like it, they're related, then for any uh, big disk A that exists a little disk B uh, with area of A greater than equal to area of B, 
and equality can hold in very um, small number of cases. Um, it's mostly strict e inequality. So in, in all of these, the, the yellow thing has, like at least one of the yellow ones has to be smaller than, strictly smaller than the red one. Okay, let's see this in examples to sort of get, give us a feel of what this actually is. Um, so I drew some of these. So if you, these are called like, um, it's the unknot and it looks like an eight and there's a plus crossing, so it's eight plus. Um, and if you have an eight plus A at the bottom and eight plus B on the top, you must have A is less than B. But if you change um, the, the sign to minus, then if this is A and this is B, A has to be greater than B. Okay, and similarly you can do, do so the top things you can arrange them to be exact, but if you take trefoils, this is not exact, and uh, but it, it still satisfies the relative exact condition. And so if you have a trefoil bottom slice, but the plus crossings, then again, you get the same sort of um, inequalities for the middle triangle. Um, and the motto is that, um, oh, nice, I made that disappear. Okay, so the motto is that plus corners make this crow. And minus corners make them shrink. Like as you go up in Y2 coordinates. Okay, and there's an example over here where we drew that um, this corner one was big and everything else was possibly a little best candidate. But if I chose that A1 was greater than A2, greater than A3, greater than A4, that would imply um, that A4 has to be greater than B. So we can get area conditions on funky looking knots as well. I'll be using this example on the corner more. Okay, um, any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, I'm gonna start describing um, sort of an algebraic structure, which I, we think um, captures all of this. So first I'm gonna define um, the algebra coming from a slice. What is a slice if you have a Lagrangian L, a is like L intersection R3A, just a slice. Um, it's called a Lagrangian slice or a slice. And what else do I need to say? Okay, so each of this, like if it's in most cases, you'll get a diagram. So we can call this the LA. Okay, so um, let R Oops. Let R be the set of double points of DLA. So this is going to look very like um, a lot of floor homology type definitions. Okay, um, let it be the set of double points of DLA. Um, a new thing we're going to use is a signed action for each of the double points. Um, how do we define it? Let alpha of A be equal to, I'll write it out first, um, an integral of the area form and a sign. Um, so if A is a point, this is a double point A, we take a point like starting at A in sort of the anti-clockwise direction, like right around A. And this sign is the sign over here, and this is the integral, okay? Um, so if this is plus and it was a lobe exactly looking like the one I have here, this would mean that the action is positive. If I swap the sign to minus, it will become negative. Okay, let our upper bar be um, all the points in R such that the action is greater than zero and let our lower bar be those where the action is less than zero. Okay. 
Um, so in this example picture over here, um, so if we have two diagrams, so, so for the top one, I'll denote it by R upper bar plus and R lower bar plus. Um, so it turns out the only one with positive signed action is C in the corner here, because the picture is exactly like this. Um, and the other two, the action is negative. <clears throat> and for the bottom boundary, um, we have only one point which has positive action, and this is empty. Uh, turns out if the R lower bar is empty, it means that that diagram has a Lagrangian representative. Once we have this, um, we define an algebra A to be the free unital um, algebra over Z2 generated by, um, so I'm going to just say Q A upper bar, when A is an R upper bar, and Q B lower bar when B is an R lower bar. Okay. Um, cool. Okay, so you, you should think of this. So we're going to soon start talking about holomorphic disks. And this uh, diagram is sitting in R2 and has the standard complex structure coming from C. Um, and we can think of um, holomorphic disks um, here. and a is like all the points these holomorphic disks can end. Like if it's a floor strip, it has a start and end. Okay, we'll get to that more concretely soon. And we define A hat to be the module over, okay, it's vector space, but whatever, um, over Z2 generated by um, Q P A upper bar and Q P B lower bar. Um, where Q belongs to A, P, A, oh, sorry. And then you have one point P for A belongs to R upper bar or B belongs to R lower bar, okay? Um, and then we have that A hat can act on A hat by, um, what do we do? We replace um, any P, A with, um, this operator, what do I mean by that? Suppose you have something that looks like P Q1, P2, acting on Q2, Q3, Q2, P4, then you'll get two terms. Every time there's a P2 and a Q2, you'll um, sort of glue it over there. Yeah, so this is sort of the standard gluing that you do. You just stick things on. Um, okay. So I, I'm gonna use like this picture description for A, um, but okay, let's use a new page. Okay, so I'm gonna draw this green box, which represents R and divide it into two parts. The left side is our upper bar, and the right side is our lower bar. And an element of A hat uh, will be an arrow, which could be like this, but also like this. Um, OK, how are these arrows working? Um, let's define a special element. Oh, sorry, no. Um, so the action, so A hat can act on, by the same way on A. And how does it do that? It takes a point and the arrows push it to the other endpoints. Um, but algebraically, it's the same as replacing uh, PAs by P. OK, <clears throat> once we have this, we define a special element inside a hat, which keeps track of all actual disks that appear. 
Um, and how do we do that? Um, sum of, yeah, so you count all the tests that appear. And I'll tell you what these signs are in a second. Um, I'm going to draw these signs in green because they're slightly different. Let's call these uh, floor signs. So the floor sign at an intersection at a like double point is equal to the diagram sign that we already had, but multiply it by the sign of the action at that point. So if it's in our upper bar, um, so let's see, plus minus the green ones is equal to plus minus the diagram signs if the point is in our upper bar and it's swapped if it's in lower bar. Okay. Um, and then when we're counting this, we want one green positive and uh, multiple green negatives. Okay. Um, once we have this special, okay, I don't want to call it H hat, I just call it H. Okay. Once we have H, we can define a derivative on A by acting by H, right? And it's actually a derivative um, claim that this is equal to zero. And this is the same proof as you would give in showing that LCH is actually like Legendrian contact homology or um, is like actually works. Okay. Okay, so we have an algebra for a slice um, and a derivative on it. And note that if you're given a pair of diagrams, like one candidate for an upper diagram and one for lower, uh, we get just to we get two um, sets of things. We get a plus minus a hat plus minus two special elements counting all the disks h plus minus, and then we get two derivatives. Okay. So this is all sort of, like it's very similar to um, the genre and contact homology, but we just have these, we have two sets of signs going on. Okay. Okay, but now we will introduce something new. Um, I'm gonna define an algebra sitting in the Lagrangian cobordism as well, but I have a new object called a Lagrangian tangle, which is almost like a cobordism. Uh, so it's again, like compact, connected, oriented, but this time I want it to be immersed. Um, uh, it's a immersed Lagrangian T, again, sitting in sort of a restricted uh, piece of R4, right? And you want the boundary to be um, similarly the intersection with two um, hyperplanes. Um, but we want the boundary to actually be sitting in copies of R2. What do I mean by that? R2A is when the fourth coordinate is eight and there's no X2 height. So these are sort of flat sitting in a copy of R2. Um, we want T to be embedded on the interior so it's only double points are in this like bizarre boundary. Um, and then we'll keep the relative exactness because, um, but it's just away from the boundary. Okay. Um, this is a Lagrangian tango. Here's a picture for it. So the boundaries are sitting in copies of R2, right? So why do we want this? So given, um, sorry. So if we have a Lagrangian cobordism, uh, we can add some tiny colors to like squish the uh, boundary and get a Lagrangian tango. Okay. Um, and we can sort of do this in like um, super tiny height. Uh, in fact, you can like show that you can make the height almost zero. But what do I mean by that? If um, we have a diagram D minus undercutting D plus that is this supposed to exact, exist a Lagrangian cobordism with all those properties, then we actually get a Lagrangian tangle 
uh, with the boundaries equal to these immersed curves that we described before. Like it's exactly that. Okay. Um, and then what is this bias? So note that now that we have a Lagrangian with boundary sitting in a copy of R2, which is um, a complex plane. So let's take R4 with the standard um, complex structure where these two are paired and these two are paired. And then these R2s are complex planes. So these disks that we've been talking about till now in just a sort of combinatorial manner um, and which appear over here um, are literally holomorphic disks with corners. And they have boundary on a Lagrangian I know a lot about, right? So then we can, um, um, but also given this, we might have a holomorphic disk that go sort of completely inside and have corners on the top and the bottom boundary. So putting all these together, we're gonna develop a similar looking algebra that we were doing for each slice, okay? Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna call a hol holomorphic disk a horizontal disk. Um, if um, its image is contained in R2A or R2B. Like these things that you see literally on the boundary, those are horizontal disks, okay? Okay, um, any questions? Oh, can you say again, you said there was a connection when you drew the blue to looking at slices. Can you say again? I, I just missed what you oh, said. I'm just loud. saying that um, the, there's a lot of holomorphic that's sitting with boundary on this Lagrangian tango, and some of them might have um, um, might have all their corners on one side, but some of them might have corners on both sides. Um, and I'm just going to now describe how, like, we made a slice algebra. We're going to make a similar looking algebra for the entire system. I see. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. So let's do that. Okay. Um, know that. So now we have two green boxes, uh, sets of green boxes, one for the top boundary and one for the lower boundary. And we're going to define an algebra B to be the um, unital. Oops. Um, algebra generated over Z2 by. So now there's a slight restriction. Um, we either take Q lower bar plus, so points from the top boundary, which are in the lower bar. Um, or Q upper bar minus. Okay, so that um, in these boxes are either points in like the, the points in these two boxes that I marked, not the other ones. And why do we do that? These are where um, non-horizontal uh, this can end. Okay, what do I mean by that? Um, so if you have a non-horizontal disk, so one that doesn't lie in the top or the bottom slice, it turns out that the signs can only be plus on top, which means when you're moving in the like complex orientation on the boundary, you're jumping from higher X2 to lower X2, and in the bottom, it can only be minus. Um, you, you need to show it, it's not so hard. Okay, but that means if this point is in R upper bar plus, this, the green sign, the floor sign is the same, and it's different when it's R in our lower bar plus. Uh, similarly, Um, it's swapped here. So we are only considering where you can actually have these green signs to be minus, okay? 
um, and we put those in B. But B hat is going to be a vector space, uh, vector space over Z2 uh, generated by sort of every possible thing. So you take Q, P, A, um, where Q is in the free product over these two A. So you can take whatever the hell point you want. Um, and A is also any old point. Okay. And then similar to before, we have an action of B hat on B hat and B hat on B. Um, so B hat are like arrows which push um, the points in B to their endpoints, like the, you have to follow the arrow. Okay. And we have inclusions from A hat uh, plus minus, so the two of them into B hat. Uh, which give actions of a hat plus minus on b hat. Cool. Okay. And then similar to before, when we counted all these disks, which now we call horizontal disks, those were h, uh, we have a special element f in b hat, which is counting all um, disks sitting genuinely in the full Lagrangian. Um, so we're counting things with, let me try drawing it. So points Q could be anywhere here. And A, my A and Q look rather similar, I should. Okay, so there's one plus sign and multiple minus signs, which can be at either boundary. Um, all of this can be at either boundary. And this has to be rigid. Um, <clears throat> and because of this thing here, um, we know that our disks can go like this, um, or they can go like this, but actually they can also be like multiple things like this. Yeah, but the sort of endpoints um, and starting points have to be like, the endpoints are in uh, these diagonals and the starting points are in these diagonals. Okay, but then you can go crazy. Okay, but you can't go crazy. This is like actual geometric information from uh, the, this thing, but the, like, the disk can go crazy. Okay. Okay, and what do we do with this? Now we wanna again define some like maps on the, um, so we're going to define this LF, which is sort of like an ideal um, by defining some relations, um, which also correspond to glowing. So we uh, say that P upper hat minus is LF del Q bar uh, minus. Okay, what does this mean? So remember, we could have a vertical non-horizontal disk that looks like this. And then if you glue on something to its endpoint, you get this relation. Um, so the, the purple ones are the ones sitting in F. Um, or you could have Q plus minus. Okay, I'm gonna just write these up. They're sort of hard to say, um, which corresponds to the same sort of thing, but gluing at the other end. Um, and we could also do for the other set of things. Let's see. Um, Q. Okay. Uh, the these this can you could glue at the end or the beginning. Okay. And then this lets us define these maps from B hat to B hat, and also from B to B, um, where you replace the terms with appropriate um, relations described in LF, okay? So if, if you had one of these red disks, um, let's see, so if we had this one, copy, that would be replaced by uh, what would it be 
Bye. Okay, um, this is a bad example because, so actually what happens is you have to glue at like multiple ends at the same time. So you would also have something like this, and then it would glue to give you this as the image. Like the red one would be pushed to the blue one. Okay. Okay, so you have some maps in from B hat and B. Um, and what can we do using that? So remember, we had these horizontal disks, which were sitting in the boundary slices. Um, those were the elements H plus and H minus, and we could just include them to get an element um, inside B hat. Um, and uh, we claim that if you take this element, which is all horizontal things, and restrict to L, which means glue on all the vertical things you can find, you actually get zero. What is happening here, um, H restricted to L is counting uh, all boundary points of all one-dimensional uh, modelized spaces of disks with corners and boundary on the tangle T. Um, and what are we saying? That it means that all these boundary points look like uh, like one horizontal disk and a bunch of other things glued onto it. So it looks like one of these like four things here. It could look a little wilder also. Um, and then to so notice that if you look at all the horizontal disks in this picture, um, the ones that come alone are what we define to be uh, big disks way back in the beginning of the uh, talk. And the ones that come as part of broken disks, like these ones, are little disks. So this, um, this theorem is telling you that this big and little disks have to come in pairs, right? Um, and if two of them are boundary points of the same modelized space, um, the area uh, is preserved and holomorphic curves have non trivial, uh, non have positive area. So the yellow ones always have to be like strictly smaller than the red ones, right? So this is um, point, like sort of recovering the obstruction we described before. Um, but there's more to the story. Um, but this element capital H lets us define a differential um, on B where you first act by uh, H. So you push things in the horizontal slice and then you restrict to L, which means you push them um, by gluing in um, non-horizontal disks. And we claim that this is actually a differential um, and so you get a complex, B del B, and you get a bunch of homologies. Um, okay, so what are we gonna do with this? Um, we're gonna define chain maps, of course, right? Um, so how do we define a chain map? Um, for any point Q, we first uh, include it into B and then uh, restrict to L which is just like pushing using the non-horizontal disks. Um, and we claim that J plus minus are chain maps, right? Um, what does that mean? Um, we have, so we had a bunch of homologies. We can take H of A plus del plus, um, and that's J plus going into the big thing and we also have things coming from the bottom. Um, and so these maps, because they're chain maps, they're well-defined on homology. And the additional claim is that J plus minus are both um, action decreasing. Okay. And that I uh, want to point out 
concept that recovers the fact that we said that these big disks have to be larger in area than their corresponding little disks. Let's look at it in this example. So over here, um, we had, uh, let's look at QC from the top over here, right? It was in um, our upper bar. And so if you have, if you take J plus, now that that means you want to put using a non-horizontal disk. Let's imagine for now that we have this disk. Under conditions I gave before, it will actually have to exist. Um, so J plus of this gets pushed by the blue disk. Right? It gets pushed down uh, to Q D, like C gets pushed to uh, D, um, which is also an upper bar. And this means that uh, action of QC has to be strictly greater than QD. It can be equal only if it's an entity. Um, and the action of this is actually area of the last lobe, which is A4, and this is B. So we're recovering the A4 has to be greater than B um, that we talked about a while ago. And also notice in this example that J minus is actually equal to identity. Why is that happening? Um, so notice that we were pushing using these um, non-horizontal disks, which can go like this or like this, which means if something is in this box or this box, it gets, um, it, it just, it gets fixed. It doesn't get moved anywhere by the J minus, uh, plus or minus maps. And if, and we remember we said before that um, our lower bar for this bottom boundary was empty, which means that this box over here is not there. So in the bottom boxes, everything is fixed. So actually what happens is that J minus is identity uh, whenever um, D minus has a Legendrian representative. So we do get two different action decreasing maps, one from the top slice into the big thing and one from the bottom slice, which is not the case in Legendrian contact homology. But that also sort of appears again that if things are Legendrian, then we don't get a map going in from the bottom, like it's just fixed. Okay, that's um, all I had to say. Great, thanks so much. Let's give Ipsita a round of applause for a great talk. Are there any questions for the speaker? Can I ask again, just a little bit about this? Um, so you're working in R4, right? Yeah. So it like R4 is very confusing because it's really hard for me to know like which is the concave end, which is the con convex end, because it looks like you can flip everything. Am I, am I right? Um, wait, can you say that again? I mean, usually when one does like Legendrians and contact manifolds, it's clear that there's like a positive end and a negative end, and they're very different. Um, yeah. But in R4, if you just slice it with these level sets, it looks like I could just switch A to B and everything would be the same except for your exactness condition. Um, yeah, um, no, the exactness condition will also be the same if you flip everything. So there is a directionality which is captured in these pluses and minuses. So okay. the pluses on the top boundary are behaving like the minuses on the bottom boundary. So yeah, you can flip everything, but you have to just remember that the signs also sort of flip. But yeah, it doesn't, it loses some of the directionality. There's like a, like you can flip it, but then you're sort of dualizing the thing. I think I understand. Uh, do you think there's like a slightly bigger theory that then incorporates both of them? Like that has the pluses on and minuses on both sides? Um, so this thing actually does have the pluses and minuses on both sides. Okay. 
Mm. But like, if you have something with a disk on like the top boundary with pluses, it can move down, but it can't move up. I think that's I, sort okay. of like the holomorphic uh, curves just behave like that. So you mm. can't. Um, so the negatives are there, but they're not. Um, they they come in smaller dimensional families. Mm -hmm. So they're not showing up as much. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I had a question, uh, just kind of a clarifying question. Yeah. Um, the uh, diagrams that you draw with these, the green uh, boxes yeah. in, in Paris yeah. there, I, it, do the top and the bottom correspond to like the top slice and the bottom slice? And then you're saying yeah. how, how disks can go between them? I see. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. The, and, um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and the, the, the fact that there's a disk, like for example, in this diagram at the top, going between C and D that gives you this condition on the area. Is that the idea? Like that the action is greater? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, the fact that that disk exists, you have to sort of, um, like you, you can say it using the area conditions like I was writing down before, that these have to be, if, if this is true, then that, disk has to exist. Otherwise, you can sort of have the blue disk turn back up or something. Um, but yeah, whenever there's a blue disk, you get this like J plus or J minus map, and they tell you something about the areas. Thanks. Are there other questions for the speaker? Okay, well, let's give Ipsita another round of applause. Thanks very much.